My task this morning is to answer the question, to wrestle with a bit, and to answer the question, is this world not our home? Is this world not our home? I'll be using as a scripture reference this morning, Revelation chapter 21, verses 1 through 4. Revelation chapter 21, verses 1 through 4, and it reads like this from the NIV. Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away, and there was no longer any sea. I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride beautifully dressed for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, look, God's dwelling place is now among the people, and he will dwell with them. They will be his people, and God himself will be with them and be their God. Verse 4, he will wipe away every tear from their eyes. There will be no more death, nor mourning, nor crying, for the old order of things has passed away, and he will wipe away every tear from their eyes. And there will be no more death or mourning or crying or pain, for the old order of things has passed away. There's an old legend that talks about an army that wasn't very good, and they were up against a very strong enemy. The enemy had more weapons, better weapons than what they had, and the men were discouraged because they had to go and confront this army. They had a king that was in place who was not at all disturbed. In fact, the king told his men, I've got a magic and a prophetic coin that I want to use. On one side of the coin was an eagle. On the other side was a bear. He told them that if I flip this coin, and if it comes out on the eagle side, we win. If it comes out on the bear side, we lose. So the king gathered the army, he flipped the coin, coin came down, and lo and behold, there was an eagle. The army was encouraged, they were inspired, and so they went out and they fought against this mighty army and they won. When they came back, the king said, I want to show you something. He took that same coin, and he showed them on one side was an eagle. On the other side was an eagle. He inspired his own people. He let them know that if they had hope and faith in themselves and what they could do, they would be inspired to do anything and everything. And I believe that this book of Revelation is the same way. I think God wants us to be inspired. In fact, we're at the end of the book, and so we see that at the very end of the book that we win. So when we look at this book, when we look, absolutely, when we look at the name of this book, for example, it is not called the Revelation of the Apostle John. John was a revelator. He was the one who received the vision, but this is called the revelation of Jesus Christ. And so this is the revelation of our Savior and soon coming King. It is based off the word apocalypsis, or as we say today, revelation, which means unveiling or disclosure. There's also, as we look at the name of this book, we can also see the need for this book. We see that the need for the book was, to, was for God to give his people hope while they were under severe persecution. There was Domitian, the Roman emperor at that time, who under his control there was widespread persecution of Christians. There were Christians who would go uh, into the arena with wild animals and they would be ripped to shreds. But because they had a hope, they would go into knowing that they were going to be martyrs. They would go in singing hymns, and they would be heard dying, singing hymns of praise to God. Why? 
because they had a hope. So there's a need for this book. Also, the nature of this book is to illustrate to God's people his connection to God. God wants to illustrate his connection with his people. And as we look at these scriptures, we start off with the very first word of this text, which is the word then. In other words, then is a word that points to a specific time, and it shows that something happened before. And if we take a look back in chapter 20, we see some powerful things going on in verse 20. We see that at that time, when we look back at verse 20, we see that Satan is bound for a thousand years, and then he's loosed. The thing that I love about this particular text is not only that Satan is bound, but it says that God took an angel or asked another angel or assigned another angel to go and do his light work. In other words, this was not something that God did himself. This was an angel fighting against a fallen angel and binding him for a thousand years. That just goes to show how much power, number one, our God has, and how much power our angels have over the fallen angels. So we see that in chapter 20. Also, we see the great white throne judgment. Now, this great white throne judgment is for those who are facing God's standard without the aid of Christ. This is not the, the, the saints of God who are standing before this great white throne judgment, but this is for those persons who can, felt like they could do it, they could face God's perfection all on their own. So these are the people who are judged uh, on their own works without the aid of Christ. And then what we see also in chapter 20 is the death of death. I don't know about you, but I'm, I'm really tired of people dying around me. I'm really tired of it. I have a, a, a cousin who, who just passed this same week. We were told that he has about a year. Last week we were told he has about a year. He has cancer. He's got about a year. He went home, and when he got home, they said, well, he has about a month. And two days later, he was gone. I'm so sick of death. In fact, when I was growing up, I couldn't say <laughs> in my grandparents' home, I couldn't use the word hate. My sister would do something with me, and I would say, I hate you. I didn't mean it, but I would say, I hate you. And if my grandmother would hear those words whew, coming out of my mouth, um, let's not call, let's, I'm having flashbacks, but, <laughs> but I hate death. I'm so tired of it. But verse 20 says that there's a death for death in, in chapter 20, rather. So as we look at this and move forward, John says, then I saw a new heaven and a new earth for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away, and there was no longer any sea. Now, when we look at this, we have to understand, as we look at the question, is this world not our home? I say, number one, no, it's not. And as we look at this, we have to look even at the design of our bodies. If you don't believe the Word of God, even scientifically, we know that we can't live in places like Mars or Venus or Pluto or Jupiter, we can only live on Earth. We can only live here because we can't breathe the air from those other places. But then when, when we look at Earth, we can see that we are here for only a few years and then we're gone. And so if we're only here for a few years and then we're gone, we have to assume that number one, this world, scientifically speaking, cannot be our home. If this world was our home, we would be here forever. John says that he saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first one, first heaven and earth, had passed away. And then he says there was no longer any sea. Now, when he talks about new, that comes from a word not meaning that, oh, God made something, the devil messed it up, and now God's got to throw it all away. No, it means new in quality, new or fresh. In other words, God's going to take what's there and transform it into something that is brand new. The idea is redemption. 
Just because the devil has put his ugly hands on something does not mean that it is gone, that it is no more good. Case in point, look at our lives. When the devil put his ugly hands on us and had convinced us that we should go left when God said go right, God says, wait a minute, I'm going to stand here and wait on them because I've got something for them to do. And so instead of God throwing you away, he took you back, redeemed you, transformed you, and made you into a brand new creature. God says, I'm going to do a new thing. And then verse 1 also says, and there was no longer any sea. Now, most of us understand how the enemy will move. We understand that the enemy, we see him in Genesis chapter 1, and he comes in the form of a snake. That's really scary. But by the time we get to the end of the book, he's in the form of a dragon. And you know where he's coming out of? He's coming out of the sea. And so we see him, uh, we see the enemy now as somebody who is intimidating and somebody who's coming from a place that intimidates us. None of us can drink all the water that we want. None of us, if we were thrown into the, into the ocean, could drink salt water. So none of us could do that. So the sea was a place that represented danger and storms and separation. But here, John says, and there was no longer any sea. In other words, there was no more separation us from the other. There was no more separation us from, from, from our brothers and sisters in Christ. There was no more separation us from God. And so John wants to let us know that as we look at our absolute truth, number one, that is you are not designed to stay here forever. You are not designed to stay here forever. And if we look at verse, at chapter, at verse 2, it says, And I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down from God, prepared as a bride beautifully dressed for her husband. Talked about the the death, but let me talk about the wedding. The wedding was celebrated by another family member on yesterday. And when I... (laughs) I couldn't, have but, uh, couldn't, couldn't help but laugh and look at my uh, younger cousin as his, as, or imagine, because I saw him from behind, um, but imagine what his face looked like when he saw his bride walking down the aisle. I thought, wow, this is, this is, <laughs> this is outstanding. Here's this, this kid that I, I wanted to adopt as a, uh, uh, when he was younger, and now he's standing here, grown man getting married. And the look on his face when he saw his bride. His bride dressed herself. I watched her. She had this long gown on, and she had to, you know, however y'all do. I I don't know how. I I don't wear gowns. And so however y'all do with gowns, you know, you had to maneuver with the heels and all of that. But she dressed herself. The new Jerusalem, like a bride, is going to be dressed by God. It's going to be dressed by God. That's a beautiful thing. It's a beautiful thing. And, and John says about this beautiful city, <coughs> excuse me, that it's a holy city. It's a heavenly city. It's a prepared city. It's a beautiful city. It's a city for perfect, it's a perfect city. And it's only for perfect people. Only perfect people can be there. But another thing I like about what John saw, what John saw this revelation of Jesus Christ, and the Bible says John saw it coming down from heaven. In other words, that's symbolic of what God does for us. God doesn't wait on us to get it together. He comes down to our level, and he meets us right where he is, where we are. You remember the the story of the, of the, the woman and, and the man, you know, they let the brothers go. But you, know, you remember the story of the woman caught in the very act of adultery? They brought her before God. They brought her before Jesus, and they said, now what? You've been preaching and teaching all this stuff. Now what? What do you say? Because Moses said, here's what we should do. What do you say? Are you going to contradict what Moses said? And you know what the Bible says Jesus did? He condescended. 
he just stooped down and he started writing. He started writing some stuff. And the Bible does not specify what he wrote. But what we know he wrote was something, there were two, two it was two pronged. It was grace. And it was also sin. It had to show the people with rocks in their hands that they too had sinned because he said to them, now let he without sin cast the first stone. Jesus stooped down and it's the same way God does with us. He comes down to our level. I may not be able to understand things like you. They may be your thing, your, the, your understanding may be too wonderful, and I may not be as intelligent as you. And I don't need to be because God can stoop down to my level and reveal to me. God condescends, and that's a good thing. <clears throat> the city also, this new city, implies socialization. So I want to say to you, as we who (laughs) are blessed by God, we begin to uh, uh, look for places to stay. We begin to look for a home. We begin to look for all of those places. What, what, What does that mean? That means that most of us, if we had enough money, would get the money and move out of the city. I want to tell you to get your mind right because in the new city, it's going to be just that. It's going to be a city. It's going to be a place where there's hustle and bustle. It's going to be a perfect city, though. So I I can't imagine the traffic. But anyway, it's going to be a perfect city. It's going to be a place where we have to get along with each other. It's going to be a place where we love each other. It's going to be a place where we actually know our neighbors. It's going to be a place, you know, and they took, you know, the word, you know, they talk about the hood. The hood, the hood. They take the neighbor out of the hood, and now it's just the hood. We don't even know our neighbors. We don't know each other. We don't even know half know ourselves. And so we get in our cars, we go in our homes, we lock our doors, and we're now just the hood. We're not the neighborhood anymore. But in this city, you're going to have to know your neighbor. You're going to have to know who you're talking to. You're going to know your neighbor. Not only that, you're going to love your neighbor, and get this, your neighbor's going to love you. We don't know how they're going to look. They might look like you. There's that myth that if, if we move beside, you know, we move bus, beside people that look like us, then we're in safety. That's a safe place. That's not true. Right, right. So we don't know how they're going to look, but we know that they're going to love us. Yeah. We don't know how they're going to look. I used to hear my grandparents tell us that back in their day, they used to do certain things in their home, and one of the things that they could do was walk away, not even lock their doors. And I'm thinking, what kind of a place did you live in? Didn't even lock their doors, just walked away. But I also heard them say that they knew their neighbors. They reached out to one another. There was socialization. And one of the things that we have to do better, not only as a, a city in that place, but as a church home, is that we've got to reach out to each other. We've got to learn how to love each other. We've got to encourage each other. When we see somebody down, we've got to go running to the rescue, not saying, oh, well, that's on them. I've got my my own problems, right? We have problems, but we also are called to minister one to the other. So my absolute truth, number two, is that the new city, New Jerusalem is a holy city, a heavenly city, a prepared city. Jesus says, I go now and prepare a place for you and a beautiful city. Verse 3, and I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, look, God's dwelling place is now among the people and he will uh, dwell with them. He will, they will be his people and God himself will be with them and dwell with them. They will be his people and God himself will be with them and be their God. I just want to say as absolute truth number three is that hope must be loud. Hope must be loud, not in terms of volume, but in terms of power. Hope has to be loud. There's a story that's told of two men that were serving time in a dungeon. There were two men serving time in a dungeon. They were told that they were given 10 years in the dungeon. One of the men was, was, was told Listen, 
your, your wife and your child, they are deceased. They are no more. The other man was told, your wife and your child are living and they're waiting on you. The man uh, just a uh, few, two, three years uh, uh, went into this sentence, and the man who felt like there was no hope for him, there was nothing for him to look forward to because his wife and his child were gone. They were dead. That man didn't make it out. The other man not only lived, but he lived the whole 10 years, and he walked out of the dungeon. When we have hope, we can look forward to some stuff today because we're looking into tomorrow, seeing that tomorrow's gonna be a, a whole lot better than it is today. And what is hope except the belief that our tomorrow is gonna be a better day, that we can get through day by day by day simply by, by believing in our tomorrow. We've gotta get there. <clears throat> a loud voice announced the star of the show, and even today, the star of the show is none other than our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. So when that loud voice announced that not only will we see him, but we will be able to see him as he is, and we'll be able to see him as he is because we will be as he is. You remember Moses <clears throat> when he first uh, uh, got a glimpse of, of who God is, and, and, God, and Moses said, God, I want more. I want to see you. I, wanna, I want to see you, and, 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 and God honored him in a way. The Bible says that he put him in the cleft of a rock, and he put his hand over the rock, and he passed by. And God said, I'll let you see my afterglow. You can't see me, because if you see me, you'll die. But in this text, the Bible says that God will be among us, implying that we're going to see God face to face. I don't know about you, but that is a new... That's, a, that's something new for me, and it inspires me, and it allows me to go from day to day, troubles every day, all day, troubles to, from day to day, because I've got a hope that I'm going to wake up one day and see God face to face. Yes, sir. That last verse says that he will wipe away, he will wipe every tear from their eyes. There will be no more death, hallelujah, no more mourning or crying or pain for the order of the old things, for the old order of things has passed away. And I just want to share that the absolute truth number four is that tears, grief, mourning, crying, and pain have no place in the new Jerusalem. That will be the perfect people zone. We know that we're right here right now in the no perfect people zone, so all of us fit, right? But there are going to be some folk in that day that you're going to look at and I'm thinking, I didn't know you were going to be here. I didn't know, you know, I didn't know that you kind of like made it over. Hallelujah. And there'll be some folk who'll look at us that way too. But it's a day when those nail-pierced hands, the Bible says, will wipe away every tear from our eye. Not just tears of this or tears of that, because the tears are only silent messengers. The tears are saying things that our mouths can't say, that tongue can't tell. The tears are just a, sim uh, a symptom of a larger issue. The, the, the tears are the fruit, but not the root. So the implication here is that God's going to wipe all of it away. It's not just the tears. It's going to be tears of, of grief, of mourning, of, of hurt and pain. All of that stuff is going to be wiped away. In fact, Paul would look at this text and say, death, where is your sting? And grave, where is your victory? Some, a little later on, somebody wrote, earth has no sorrow that heaven cannot heal because those nail-pierced nail hands are going to wipe away every tear. Is this world our home? Absolutely not. This world can't be our home because there's still tears here. Every now and then, you know, we try to uh, camouflage them. We try to cry. Oh, these are happy tears when you know they're not really happy tears. You just don't want, fo want folk in your business. I got it. I do it too. But, I under but understand this, that every tear will be wiped away. 
all of your burdens, all of your sorrows, all of your pain, all of your debt, everything will be wiped away. God's going to wipe every tear away. And we will be like him, for we will see him as he is. <clears throat> that leads me to my bottom line. And as many people are trying to live their best life down here with all of these tears and all of these worries and all of this concern, understand this, that your best life is, is not here. Your best life is yet to come. Your best life is yet to come. And I want to let you know that, yes, we are in the no perfect people zone here, but your best life will be in the perfect people zone. And you can get there, too. And we know how to get there because we know our ABCs. Amen? We know our ABCs. We know that we have to admit right here, right now, that we are not perfect, that we have not been perfect, that we have transgressed the, the will of God. We have to admit, A, Admit that you have not always lived a life that is pleasing to God. If you want to see God face to face, if you want to walk in this new Jerusalem where folk are killing each other over what is going to be used as pavement in that city, if you want to walk in the new Jerusalem, you have to admit that you've not always lived a perfect life. B, you have to believe that Jesus is the right way to have right fellowship with the Lord, with our Lord. So Jesus Christ is the way, the truth, and the truth.